I'd like to call to order the meeting of the Parks and Recreation Commission. Pledge of Allegiance, Mr. Forsell. Ready? Pledge. I pledge, I pledge allegiance to, to the flag of the United States, States of America and, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, nation under God, God indivisible, with liberty, liberty and justice for all. Roll call, Ms. McGill. Chair Connor. Present. Longstreet. Here. Purcell. Here. Gonzalez. Here. Clara Mohall is not here and interned. Gonzalez is not here. Um, Ms. Rapp, any changes to the agenda? I have none, Chair Connor. Thank you. Public comment. Any member of the public may address the commission for up to one minute on any subject within the jurisdiction of the commission that is not scheduled for a public discussion before the commission. Okay. Commissioner committee assignment reports. Commissioner Longstreet. Uh, I attended the Creeks Advisory Committee meeting this month where we had a joint meeting with the Golf Advisory Committee um, regarding some projects at the golf course. And we also took a tour the day before of the proposed projects. And it was a, a very good meeting. I think we've, um, as this project moved forward, we'll see some great water quality improvements. And the Golf Course Advisory Committee and staff um, were really just wonderful to work with. It was nice to see that harmony. And I also, just on another note, when the um, USS Ronald Reagan was in, I did go down to the skateboard park to see the painting. I did not paint, I admit that. But it was really nice to see um, all of the sailors out there helping out and painting that whole facility. Thank you. Any, anyone else? I attended the Tennis Advisory Committee um, meeting this month, and we discussed the completion of the new lighting system at Municipal and at Las Positas. Uh, there's a new system in place now where you can turn the lights on for a short for a period of time while you're playing tennis, and then uh, turn them on again so that they're not continuously running. Uh, should save a lot of electricity in both things before the lights just came on. As you might notice, they were on until 9 or 10 o'clock whenever they go off without uh, interruption. So um, I know Kathy Carpenter and the staff have been working on this for, seems like, forever. And they had some Prop 12 money and gathered some other money and put it all together, and it will be a big money saver. Um, also discussed uh, future capital projects and possibly doing some more uh, lighting of some additional courts. Thank you. Um, anyone else? Uh, yes, I did attend the uh, community wellness educational forum that I think Ms. Rapp is going to um, report on that. So and I'll have some recommendations later. Thank you. Yes, and uh, I also attended that forum, and I'll wait for Ms. Rapp to comment. Youth Council report, um, we'll skip that. And on to summary of council actions. Um, any comments or highlights, Ms. Rapp? Council actions? Actually, related to council actions, but not in your packet, is that um, council member E.F. Falcone, when the council members made their new liaison appointments, um, Ms. Falcone is our uh, liaison to the Creeks Committee and our, you probably know how to say it best, because I, I can't think of the terminology now for the Parks and Recreation. There, there's, a, there's a lot of stuff, actually, that connects <laughs> me to this committee. Madam Chair, members of the, uh, of the committee, um, I would like to just uh, introduce myself. I'm Mia Falcone, a member of council, and uh, I am your uh, latest liaison, and I uh, wanted to come and uh, express my thanks for uh, all the work that you do. I am the liaison of uh, six years standing to the Creeks Committee and also and serve with uh, Ms. Longstreet uh, on that committee. Also the uh, City Council representative to the Parks Foundation where I served with Madam Chair for many, many years. Uh, also we are part of the uh, regional Park and Recreation uh, Commission Committee that meets with uh, the cities of Goleta, 
uh, the various different uh, organizations around the city of Santa Barbara, the county of Santa Barbara, uh, folks like the Page Youth Foundation, UCSB, and a lot of other recreational uh, groups in, ta in, in the area, in, in the region. And we could look at recreation from a regional point of view. And uh, we've been a little dormant lately, but we're planning on becoming much more active in the future. And so I welcome any of your questions or concerns, and please feel free to call on me at any time. Welcome, and okay. we're very glad to have you. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Item number two, approval of minutes. Uh, I move for approval of the <coughs> minutes of the December 12th, 2007 regular meeting. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Passes unanimously. Volunteer recognition. Chair Connor, Assistant Director uh, Jill Zachary will uh, make the preparatory comments for this presentation. Madam Chair, members of the Park and Recreation Commission, this month we'd like to recognize the Santa Barbara Mountain Bike Trail volunteers for their volunteer maintenance of the Jesus Cedar Trail. As uh, two of our commissioners are well aware, because they've been um, very much involved in the Front Country Trails Task Force for the past year, uh, portions of the Front Country Trails are within the city of Santa Barbara, um, within the unincorporated county. The majority of them are actually within the National Forest. And the National Forest has an easement to maintain those trails um, through areas that are owned by the city. Um, because the city has never been a trail maintenance organization, we've relied greatly on the Forest Service and then also volunteers uh, to maintain the trails that are used by many Santa Barbara residents, both city and unincorporated county residents and, and visitors to Santa Barbara. Um, and the Santa Barbara Mountain Bike Trail volunteers, and we do have three of their members here, so maybe they want to come up to the front. Um, to um, receive the recognition has been around for 16 years. Um, they do more than trail maintenance. They actually do user education. Um, they sponsor bike events, generally promote uh, use of our trails, considerate use of our trails. They've worked closely with other trail groups, and, and in the last year, um, that's become even uh, more involved with monthly meetings and things um, going on to get to a uh, a greater management focus on our front country trails. Today's recognition is for their most recent volunteer work. Um, in early December, December 1st, uh, they had 18 volunteers that repaired a section of trail that's right at the beginning of Haste to See the Trail, where many trail users are likely to go because you don't have to hike five miles to get to this section. So it's one of those areas that's more readily accessible. They widened the trail, they fixed a slide, they put in water bars, all the things that make our trails more accessible to many people in Santa Barbara. And we'd like to take this opportunity to thank them for the work on the 1st of December, previous work, and then also we know as we move forward into the future, we'll be working with them and other trail user organizations um, on the front country. Hello, gentlemen, and thank you. I would like to uh, read um, in appreciation the City of Santa Barbara Parks and Recreation Department presents to the Santa Barbara Mountain Bike Trail Volunteers this 23rd day of January for their volunteer trail maintenance. The volunteer work provided by the Santa Barbara Mountain Bike Trail Volunteers is greatly appreciated and provides a valued service to the Santa Barbara community. Thank you very much. And if you'd like to state your name, thank you. And uh, perhaps say a few words on behalf of your other volunteers, if you'd like. State my name. Uh, <laughs> my name is Jed Hirsch, and there's actually five of us here. There's three more back there. Come forward and be recognized. Thank you very much. We appreciate um, your hard work. Thank you. My name is Chris Orr. I'm the vice president of the Santa Barbara Mountain Bike Trail Volunteers. And I'd like to thank the commission and the city for this, this recognition of volunteer trail work. And I'd especially like to thank Jill Zachary for kind of officiating the first volunteer work and participation through the city on a trail, which kind of signifies the future partnership between volunteer organizations, the city, the county, and the Forest Service in the way of volunteers taking care of our trails. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you. Madam Chair, I have one comment as well. The weekend before last, my wife and I were hiking on the uh, Hesasita Trail, and uh, we were commenting about what good shape it's in. And uh, uh, we hike there frequently, probably more than any other place, and it is in very good shape and really appreciate it. It makes it uh, that much more enjoyable. And we only ran into one bicyclist the whole time we were out, and he had a bell, and he referred to himself as a mountain goat. And <laughs> no problems. Worked out very well. So uh, very good work up there. And I'd just like to echo my thanks, and thanks for your participation in the Front Country Trails Working Group. I think with everybody at the table, we're really going to make some progress, and we have so far, and I think we'll come to a good resolution for everyone. So thank you for all that time. Thank you. And all of the people that aren't here as well. Definitely. Um, next, I would like to move to commission and staff communications. Um, any communications, Ms. Rapp? Chair Connor, I wanted to take this opportunity to um, talk briefly about the uh, work session that was referred to earlier. Actually, it was a community wellness educational forum that was uh, put on by the Community Wellness Coalition in addition to um, the Plan Santa Barbara folks for the city. The intent was to have a focus on community health and how those issues should be looked at related to the city updating the general plan. It was a very good program and we had representatives from air quality management and nutrition and transportation and I spoke on the relationship between health and parks. The, work, the workshop is going to be televised so I hope that if people get the opportunity to watch they will. There was a lot of good information shared um, and a good good discussion about how all of these issues relate to Santa Barbara. One thing in particular, um, I and we have talked about it when we had an update from um, the planning staff not too long ago related to where they are with Plan Santa Barbara. And they are looking to advisory committees for policy recommendations to go forward to the Planning Commission and to City Council um, that need to be considered. In preparing for the presentation that I did on Saturday, I read through all of the existing, you know, land use element and, and conservation element, and some of those are the things, and, and, and clearly a lot of thought has gone into existing policy and there is already a lot there. Um, but I do think that it would be good for the Commission to have a discussion to read through the materials and see what additional strengthening perhaps of policies might be made and what are areas that are uh, of a higher level of concern perhaps than the last time that the general plan was updated. So I have asked uh, Carla McGill to work with you to set up uh, a three-hour work session where we would discuss that. We will put together a, a, a packet of materials for you to read through because you will want to know what the current plan has in it because that is the policy um, and give it some thought. I do know at the same time that the Creeks Advisory Committee is addressing these issues and I would expect when we actually receive their recommendations that it will be on the Commission agenda the focus of this work session will be on parks and recreation and um, at a later time we'll include more of the environmental recommendations that will come out of the Creeks Advisory Committee process um, with the Commission. So um, I think it was a very good forum. It began some good discussion. I shared with you the PowerPoint because there's a lot of very, very good information in here uh, that needs to have a, have a bit of life of its own as we go through this process. And I will be prepared at that work session to just, you know, overview some of this information again 
as we begin our discussion. So uh, I don't. I really appreciated the fact that Chair Connor and Commissioner Gonzalez were uh, in attendance at the forum, and any additional comments that you would like to make uh, would be appreciated. Commissioner Gonzalez. Uh, yeah, I think you covered already, and I was going to make some recommendations as to uh, providing the community with the, the information that was super important, um, not only to the people who were there, but also it should be distributed to the um, community in Santa Barbara. Um, maybe at that, at later in our working session, we'll probably recommend also that we should have some information in Spanish. Um, I, I think it's super important. I learned a lot of stuff that I never thought about it, but it's really interesting. And, and you did a good job, Nancy. Thank, Thank you. you. Yes, and I'd, I'd like to also comment about the keynote speaker, Richard Jackson, was an excellent speaker and set the, the tone for the panel, which did a, a, a great job at disseminating information. And um, it was very enjoyable. It was good to see that it was well attended. And um, I think that uh, the meeting that we'll be having in the future will answer some of the questions that we may have along the handouts. And I thank you for doing that. Dr. Jackson is the former head of the CDC and has um, been involved with uh, public health issues for many years. But his, the focus of his work in recent years has been the public health as it relates to the built environment. And so the fact that Santa Barbara is a, a built out city and we're dealing with urban issues um, and challenges not like other communities, that was really his focus. And I think he really had some very thought provoking comments that, that we'll see come up through the planning process. So I, I agree, he was very, very um, informative and um, and really makes you think about why we do what we do or don't do what we should do. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Rapp. Item number four, Street Tree Advisory Committee recommendations. 4A, approve the following street tree removal request and proposed locations at, am I correct about this address, 00 East Anapamu Street, is that correct? That's correct. It, it's uh, a lot that doesn't have an address. That's the closest we could get you for an address. Okay, that would work. Um, are there any um, comments or anything you'd like to share with us, Mr. Downey? Chair Connor, Commissioners. Um, this is an item that's been before you uh, a couple of different times. Um, originally, the project was approved to remove four pear trees um, and replace them. This came back to you uh, as an item to uh, consider the replacement trees. And at a special joint meeting in October, <clears throat> the uh, petitioner was asked to uh, come back with uh, placement of as many street trees in the sidewalk as possible and remainder of the trees to be placed within the project adjacent to the sidewalk to uh, continue shading that property. As the project has developed, uh, it's become apparent that um, the two trees adjacent to this at, uh, next to the Coffee Cat building um, would need to be applied to uh, to you for removal because of the conditions at the site. Um, so we've uh, included both of those in one application. The um, reasons for those two trees to be removed that uh, we noted were that um, one of the trees is not the designated species for that block. Uh, neither of the trees is in very good health and uh, part of the design includes tree grates uh, and tree well adjustments in the area. And in order for the trees to be in the center of the grates, they would need to be removed and placed so that the trunks could be at the center of the grates for pedestrian access. Um, the current uh, tree designation for that street is a, a calorie pear, otherwise known as the ornamental pear. Um, 
the Street Tree Advisor Committee uh, commented that um, although the trees located behind the sidewalk are not within their jurisdiction, they expressed some concern that um, the trees were not as originally planned to be um, native plantings. Um, they recommended considering planting toyon or redbud in there as opposed to the pear trees. Um, at the uh, Historic Landmarks Commission meeting that I uh, went to on this matter, their comments were that they disagreed with that statement and that uh, they felt the pears worked well uh, and they matched quite well with the trees across the street at the library. Um, the uh, committee and staff recommend you approve these two removals and the locations on the plan that was attached. Um, also, if you have questions, uh, Jeanette Kendo is here, if you have any other questions for her. Thank you, Mr. Downey. Any questions or comments from the commissioners at this time? Yeah. Could you... Um I remember when we had this the last time around and there was some confusion about the number of trees going in and trees going out and the difficulty of putting them in um, the uh, uh, setbacks and the rest. Can you tell me what is the significant difference between this and the first plan that we saw, what was it, a couple months ago? What, it, what alterations uh, occurred or what changes of uh, plan? Okay, the, the, the plan that you have does not show the two proposed removal trees, um, those would be replaced at their current locations okay. within the sidewalk. Um, but the difference in this plan is that um, there are uh, now three street trees along the project okay. and four additional trees adjacent to the sidewalk. Uh, there were okay. no additional trees in the past. Okay, I'm seeing them on the map now. Okay. All right. Okay. Any other comments? Would someone like to entertain a motion? I move for approval. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Passes unanimously. Item number B. Approve the following setback tree removal requests. Item B1, 1431 Shoreline Drive. Mr. Downey? Uh, this is uh, a second tree for uh, one that you ruled on last time. Uh, the uh, applicant uh, didn't uh, understand that they needed to put in um, all the trees in their application when they applied, so, so they put in a sec second application for the second tree. Um, in looking at this tree and its location directly adjacent to a um, wooden fence, um, the committee felt that due to the aggressive nature of this tree, it would cause uh, problems for all the adjacent structures. Uh, and therefore, committee staff recommend uh, the removal be approved on the condition a tree be replanted in the setback area. Any commissioner questions or comments? Someone like to move for approval of staff recommendations concerning item B1. <coughs> Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Passes unanimously. Item number B2, 3736. Magnolia, Dixon Street. Mr. Downey. Commissioners, uh, the, um, the confusion on the street name, uh, it's known by both. Uh, so uh, just a little clarification there. This is a row of Italian cypress trees directly adjacent to the driveway. Um, they are diseased with uh, cypress canker. Uh, they will continue to deteriorate and die. Um, uh, we felt that they were poorly located, so therefore the committee and staff recommend that you approve this removal. Any questions or comments? So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Passes unanimously. Item number B3, 
1811 Ella Encanto Road. Mr. Downey? Uh, there's a large sugar gum eucalyptus adjacent to the Ella Encanto Hotel along this property. Um, over the years, it's died back, been pruned many times. The, uh, what appears to be the dead wood has been removed. It has lost a uh, large major scaffold limb off of the tree. Um, when, upon inspection, staff was unable to determine whether um, the disease uh, that they propose the tree has uh, is present. However, the signs in the tree point to uh, that's a likelihood. Um, there are other trees in the setback that you will see an application come in for next month. The biggest concern was this large tree, so they applied for this one first. Um, we feel that the tree likely will uh, end up dying, and this is a good opportunity to, uh, during construction to take care of the situation now. Um, the committee and staff recommend that you approve this removal on the condition that the oak trees uh, adjacent to this tree be preserved and that all trees within 100 feet that are 20 feet or taller be preserved. Commissioners, questions or comments or a motion? I just have a little quest, uh, a big question about the um, this qualification. Uh, if a tree is 20 foot or taller and we don't have it, it's not in our purview, do we in fact have any say over making someone keep it or not? Certainly uh, the commission could rule to uh, wait on the removal at this time. Uh, the, the committee and staff felt that it was a rather large loss and the uh, uh, con conditions that, that were mentioned would be uh, appropriate. Um, in addition, their landscape plan um, that was submitted after this point uh, shows that they are planning to do that anyway. Oh, okay. It's just, I, you know, I don't want to put a condition on that is not enforceable by us. and. Especially if we're, you know, if we're looking at some non-natives and some things that later we, we're forcing people to do things that maybe we wouldn't want them to do actually. Um, other, I guess we can accept that if it fits in with their landscape plan. Um, and I definitely think preserving the oaks is very important. So um, I would move approval. A second, please. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Passes unanimously. We all know how I feel about <laughs> big dying eucalyptus trees. <laughs> yes, we do. Moving on to item number C. Deny the following continued setback tree removal request. C1, 1727 Santa Barbara Street. Mr. Downey. Um, Ms. Yes. Before we start, Madam Chair, you might recall that I recused myself last yes, you did. month, and I will, of course, do the same this time. Okay. Thank you for that reminder. Um, Mr. Downey. Uh, Chair Connor and Commissioners, the, uh, as you recall, this uh, was brought to you last month. Your request was to um, get an opportunity to look at landscape plans and any comments by the uh, single family design board. Those are included in your packet. Um, committee and staff felt the tree uh, the, the reason for removal of the tree, that the tree was inconsistent with the proposed architecture, uh, didn't feel that that was a valid reason to remove the tree. Uh, staff does support relocation of the tree to another location. The uh, committee was adamant that they did not support relocation of the tree. Um, since the uh, application, the applicant has advised me that they have gotten two uh, separate offers to relocate the tree at no cost to the applicant or the city. 
Um, one of those is not completely confirmed, but there are some offers to relocate the tree as opposed to destroying it. Um, therefore, uh, based on those considerations, uh, the committee and staff recommend you deny the removal. Okay, thank you. Um, we have two speakers. If you would call them forward, Richard and Phil Suiting, followed by Bob Cunningham. Good afternoon. My name is Richard Suiting, the owner of the property, and this is Phil Suiting, related, but also the uh, landscape architect. And uh, we would like to make some comments uh, regarding the removal, uh, our proposed removal of the tree and relocate it. You want to go ahead and first, Phil? Um, we do have two um, offers to relocate the tree. Um, one would definitely be in Santa Barbara. The other would probably be just a um, stockpile or in storage. They don't have a confirmed location for it yet. Um, as far as removing a um, skyline tree, we are now proposing to replace that with a um, eucalyptus citriodora as well as a um, camphor tree. Um, additionally, the applicant has offered to donate a tree to the city of Santa Barbara um, for installation by the city. Um, Madam Chair, may I ask a question? Yes, Mr. Long Street. I'm looking at this picture. And I'm looking at a. That's an artist rendition of. Yes, a, and I'm looking at. Location, but that's not the size. Of I'm it. looking at a palm tree here. Yeah. Why would you want to remove that beautiful tree if you that's put one in the, the picture? And the, the the palm tree is quite a bit taller than that, and all you really see is the trunk. So that was that artistic license was taken on that rendering. But the applicant doesn't feel that the um, palm is compatible with the architecture. And, you know, there are three um, palms that are in that area. Uh, this palm in particular doesn't relate to any architecture as much as the uh, other two palms do, which are on the neighboring property to the um, south. And, in fact, I think, you know, removal of, of, of this tree would um, enhance or um, uh, complement the other two palms, which relate to the architecture of the other home next door. So when these, when these trees apparently were planted, because they're probably over 100 years old, and that's getting up there in age, even by palm trees, I guess, um, the only buildings that were built in our immediate neighborhood were eight, mid 1850s, 1870. They were Victorians and there were one next door and, and one on the Isley Street side, uh, another one on Isley, and uh, a uh, carriage house which has uh, uh, since been converted to a residence, whereas our house was a late summer. It was only built in 1906. And it didn't uh, compare at all with uh, Victorian style. It's a uh, colonial uh, revival. And so it, our feeling is that what we're building and what we ha have uh, uh, on our property um, would be much more complementary with uh, a full tree rather than a tall trunk um, oriented tree-topped palm, that, that palm is at least 45 feet tall, I mean, it, and so are the other two on the adjacent property. They, they are tall trees, and uh, that's why it was sort of difficult to find somebody interested in um, saving them and uh, transplanting them, which, which we were able to come up with. Um, and, and so I don't think that these trees uh, really relate to the present situation of the properties, at least ours and the one we're going to build. And we are uh, progressing, and our project is ready to roll. We're uh, waiting to get into the building department and uh, get, the, get the plans. So um, if we don't um, uh, get a decision that we can 
transplant these trees. We're not talking about now removing them and destroying a tree, but uh, but transplanting it. Then uh, you know we w it won't be able to be done at a later time, and because there's power poles out in front, and the access to the uh, property itself will be hindered by uh, the building. So we we feel that uh, the trees that we're adding, we're adding two trees for one. Plus, uh, we'd be de willing to donate a tree to the city, of their uh, the tree of their choice, uh, to plant where they want, um, in, in exchange for this, this uh, uh, palm tree. Thank you. Bob Cunningham. Chair Connor, members of the Commission. My name is Bob Cunningham. I'm a member of the Street Tree Advisory Committee. Uh, I've handed you a letter. I'm going to quickly read through it if you don't mind um, because I think it, it, it states what I, what I want to say. Um, the, this tree is a remnant of an old garden on the street frontage that includes two others of the same species of about the same age and size. It is a healthy specimen and was no doubt an integral part of an original design dating back to the early 20th century, maybe earlier. It does not appear that any research has been done to determine the history of the garden, so we don't know whether there is anything noteworthy about the trees. However, we should be concerned about removal of any trees of such age and stature without good cause. The tree is part of the fabric of the neighborhood. Removal of one part of this fabric, then another, then another, will eventually result in a complete change of the ambiance and the spatial definition of a large part of the 1700 block of State Street, or excuse me, Santa Barbara Street. The tree is a healthy part of our urban forest. Being charged with the preservation of an intact urban forest, we must find very good reason to allow removal of such an important element. Granted, this is but one tree, but the urban forest can remain vital and intact only if we are vigilant in protecting every increment. Finally, the applicant's reason for removing this tree is not supportable. The applicant wishes to remove the tree not because it is hazardous, diseased, or even in the way. The applicant's opinion is that the tree is not compatible with the architecture of a proposed residence to be built on the site. This tree and its two companions have coexisted with two disparate buildings for the better part of a century. As a member of the Street Tree Advisory Committee, I cannot accept the reasoning that a mature, healthy specimen tree should be removed in order to avoid a perceived and, frankly, subjective visual incompatibility with a building that does not yet exist. Um, just to go a little bit further, I think that using this reasoning to remove a setback tree really sets a bad precedent. And if you allow it in this case, you will be asked to do the same in the future. And a piece of architecture that does not yet exist uh, that's perceived to be visually incompatible with a tree that has been there for any length of time but particularly one that's as integral to the part of the neighborhood fabric as this, uh, I just don't think is a good idea. Um, I appreciate the fact that the applicants have found um, that there is somebody willing to take this tree off of their hands. Uh, it would be wonderful if this tree could be placed in another location in town where it's visible to the public, but we really don't have that kind of a guarantee. I believe that the planting of a camphor tree could occur in this space, and still uh, we could keep the, the palm tree. I, 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 don't sh I, I won't go beyond that because we're getting into design issues. But again, I think it's a bad precedent to remove a tree for this reason and would appreciate it if you would uphold the uh, Street Tree Advisory Committee's recommendation to deny. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Cunningham. Um, Commissioner, comments, questions? Yeah. Um, I did make two site visits to this tree because this tree is really, I mean, I wanted to look at this tree. And I look at the plans 
and I look at the, and I just, I don't see how it's incompatible. I understand it's tall, I understand it's big, but it is, it isn't, it doesn't block the driveway entrance. It's not, um, it really does serve a purpose there, and I think uh, my personal opinion, and I, this is, I'm no architect and I'm no landscape architect, but I think it's an addition, not a subtraction. So um, I, after seeing it and really thinking this one over and looking at the plans, um, I can't support removal of it at this time. Commissioner Gonzalez? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so you? I would move to uphold the Street Tree Advisory Committee recommendations. I need a second. Second? No. You can second. I'll second it. If you want. Um, I, I'm going to second that. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. And one abstention. So it passes. Or no? No, it doesn't pass. That was, yeah, that's true. Yes. Yes. Okay. Thank you. And everything's appealable within 10 days. Oh, right? yes, and this is appealable within 10, ten days. Thank you. To uphold the street, create, street Tree Advisory Committee recommendation. Denial of removal. Thank you. Item number five. Community Service Volunteer Projects in the Santa Barbara City Parks. Parks right. Manager Santos Escobar will give this report. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Madam Chair, Commissioners. Uh, it's uh, my pleasure uh, this afternoon to provide this report. Uh, we were uh, very uh, honored uh, on Saturday, uh, January the 12th, to have uh, uh, 13 sailors from the USS Ronald Reagan uh, come aboard and help us out at uh, Skaters Point and uh, we hadn't seen uh, this naval air, air carrier since uh, 2004 so I'm gonna show you a couple great photos of where we're at uh, Skaters Point uh, as you're well aware was uh, finalized in August 2000 and uh, we had to go through and repaint this entire structure. Uh, it had seen its uh, day and it was worn out with paint. So uh, we went through and uh, did a beautiful job painting uh, this particular structure. And and not just painting. I mean, not only painting, painting. We painting. went through and uh, primed it. Uh, we did graffiti uh, proof material on it. Uh, we, as you can see in this photo here, we're actually uh, removing some of the vines to actually apply some paint. Uh, the gentleman in the blue is actually uh, Chief uh, Cachapola with uh, the USS Reagan, and uh, he was responsible for uh, these uh, 13 uh, young uh, men and women that uh, fight for our country. How well does the graffiti proof paint work? Uh, the graffiti paint uh, works for approximately uh, a couple applications, naturally, when uh, it gets hit with graffiti, it's easier to wipe off sometimes depending huh. on the material that whoever's hitting it with graffiti, it, if they're using an enamel base, it's a little more difficult, a little more elbow grease that's required in order to remove it with the uh, graffiti removers. So Santos, do we use that on most things that we paint that would be similar to this now? Correct. Is that a we, we do. It's a common use now in our, in our city facilities. Hmm. Thanks. So as you can tell, they're we have this uh, young sailor uh, having fun. Did you at least buy him lunch afterwards? We actually did go through and provide lunch. We had right. uh, some of the best burritos in town. It's great. And uh, we actually uh, painted the entire structure. Uh, many folks thought uh, we weren't going to be able to do this, but uh, we did. Uh, we started at approximately 9 a.m. and finished at uh, 2 o'clock. And here we go with all our proud sailors. I mean, they did just a, a wonderful job. We wouldn't have uh, been able to get this job accomplished had it not been for them. 
and also in the center of the photo is uh, our city painter as well. He was leading the charge in regards to how to brush on and brush off and making sure that uh, their hands were cleaned and all that fun stuff. So, Santos, how, how do you um, how did you get the um, option to use the sailors for um, volunteers? Well, thank you for asking that. In regards to uh, getting the sailors out, Nancy Rapp and uh, Captain uh, Zyler worked very closely with the USS Reagan, and when we found out they were going to be coming to town and we were able to uh, arrange these work days. Not only did we have work days here at the Skaters Point, but at some of our local high schools as well, because there was approximately 70 volunteers from the USS Reagan that uh, worked their way throughout the city. Also with uh, Public Works, we were able to go through and do a major cleanup on Cacique Street. So we worked in conjunction with the Neighborhood Task Force and uh, Streets, uh, Rick Fulmer, uh, Nick Kabugas and uh, Mr. Uh, Campos, who uh, runs the weekend swap as well. So we got a lot of work uh, accomplished that uh, weekend. I just want to add you. very quickly that really thanks is due to the Navy League. The Navy League supports the Ronald Reagan and coordinates all of the activities for all of the sailors. And when the sailors indicated that they wanted to do community service projects while they were here, um, Cap Ned Seiler with the police department is on the Navy League and so he worked with the city to help coordinate how those projects would take place but our thanks really goes to the Navy League for helping to uh, to work with us to coordinate that thank you. thank you another project that we worked on uh, Saturday January the 12th was our annual rose pruning day and as you can tell here we're uh, going about pruning over 1,400 roses. There's over 1,700 roses in this uh, beautiful AC Pastel Memorial Rose Garden. Uh, we were able to accomplish 90% uh, of the pruning at this rose garden this particular year. This is the best uh, turnout that we've had in many, many years. And in the center right there is our rose garden coordinator, uh, Robert Fernet. It's really something to be proud of. Yeah, no, it's really something to see, you know, when these roses are in full bloom and and then we go through and prune them to rejuvenate life. And I can't wait now till April to see them all in full bloom again. Mm -hmm. Well, you got it done just in time with this weather. We did. So once again, in regards to our 80 uh, to 90 volunteers that came through and helped out, uh, we, we couldn't do it without our, our volunteers. Many of the folks that are volunteering are also members of the uh, Rose Society. And uh, once again, without their help, uh, we wouldn't have a, a beautiful garden that is an accredited Rose Garden as well. We're one of the uh, 50th, uh, there's 50 uh, accredited Rose Gardens in the entire uh, country and we're one of them. So we're completely blessed. Here we have our assistant uh, Parks and Recreation Director, Jill Zachary. She didn't know she was going to be here in this photo. Uh, she's diligently uh, printing roses, and uh, we want to thank you as well. Normally, I'm at these particular pruning days, but uh, we kind of flipped quarters, and I lost. And actually, I didn't lose. It was it was fun all the way around. So Jill went out and uh, spent you know, four hours out there, so it was great. I had a question, too. If you don't know anything about pruning roses, is there someone there to give you advice and help you along? And Correct. Uh, we have ros rosarians out there. Uh, we have uh, Mr. Dan Bufano, a longtime Santa Barbara mm -hmm. rosarian that's out there teaching uh, along with uh, Mark Vogel, a city staff uh, crew leader who is also rosarian, out helping. And we have other park staff that have pruned the rose gardens for many years that are also leading the charge along with the uh, president of the uh, Rose Society and we're out there just giving guidance and many of the folks uh, throughout the year we have approximately 60 volunteers 
that volunteer to uh, maintain this rose garden and they have their own selected beds and naturally they want to go through and prune their roses so they show up and they're also going through and very excited to help any newcomer that has no idea on how to prune or how to care for roses and giving their uh, professional knowledge on how to go through and maintain a rose. Thank you. Okay, that concludes my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you. We look forward to April. Mm -hmm. How many opportunities per year are there for this volunteering? Is it just one time a year, or would there be another time when you need volunteers as well? Uh, Madam Chair, Commissioner, in regards to the annual rose pruning, that's once a year. A year. Uh -huh. However, regarding volunteerism throughout an entire park system, we can use them every single day, okay. every weekend. So uh, all you need to do is uh, give our office a call, 564-5433, and we'll put them to, to work. Thank you. So thank you. Chair Connor, if I might make a suggestion um, as a courtesy to our applicants who are here for appo being appointed to the advisory committee, both applicants are here. Um, the other uh, appointments are all incumbents and don't require being interviewed. So I'm wondering if you would like to go to item number nine and then we'll continue with staff reports after that. Okay, let's go to item number nine. Let's see. Um, 9E. Why don't you start at A since we're going to um, go real quick? The rest of them are just going to yeah. be reappointed. Is that okay? Yeah. Okay. We'll I'll we'll be glad to do that then. And be jumping around. Thank you for that lovely suggestion. Okay. <laughs> well, let's go to item number 9A. Consider the two incumbent applicants and make reappointments to the adapted advisory committee. And those um, two reappointments are Ali Sprott Rowan. And Annie or Ann Dupee. So I could I have a motion? So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Passes unanimously. Next we move to item nine B, which are two reappointments to the Integrated Pest Management Advisory Committee, and those would be <clears throat> excuse me, Greg Chittick and Oscar Carmoni. Uh, would anyone like to craft a motion? Uh, question. Yes. Again, we're back to this three names thing here that we had before, or is that uh, for the next one that we've just put it in the same category? Oh, Corey Wells. For clarification, uh, you actually have two vacancies for community at large, and you have two reappointments. So okay. that's how that reads. And then you have one vacancy which is designated as a pesticide, um, a PAC, pest, I'm, I'm brain freeze on pesticide alternatives coalition, and that position is designated to someone from their organization, and Corey Wells is that designee. Okay, and so we need to approve that as well? Well, we would yes. cover that in okay. item number E, is okay. that correct? Okay. Um, so, if we move forward with item number C, and if I could get a motion. You mean B. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Item, I'm sorry. Item, item number B, if I could get a motion, please. Uh, move for approval of the two reappointments under number B. And um, second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Passes unanimously. Item number C, consider two incumbent applicants and make two appointments to the Douglas Family Preserve Technical Advisory Committee. And those um, two would be James Andelman and Doug Fisher. Could I have a motion? Move for approval of the two reappointments. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Passes unanimously. Item number D, one incumbent applicant for the Tennis Advisory Committee. Um, I'll let uh, Mr. Forsell. Uh, I move for approval of Gary Clark. He's doing a uh, good job of taking notes and showing up at all meetings and organizing the meetings. So we would be lost without him. Okay. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Passes unanimously. 
item number E, our new applicant for the integrated pest management. If we could have, is Corey Wells here? Corey, would you like to come forward? Anything you'd like to say? Any questions for Mr. Wells? No. Anyone like to make a motion? I'd move to appoint uh, Corey Wells to the um, Integrated Pest Management Advisory Committee. All those second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Passes and unanimously. Thank you. We look forward to having your expertise available to the city. Yes. Thank you very much. And item number F. Interview one new applicant for the Golf Advisory Committee, and that would be, one second, is it? Uh, Irelli? Irel Beatty. Okay. <laughs> That's okay. Um, would you like to say anything? The Executive Women's Golf Association. I'm the current president of that organization and have served on the board for a number of years. Um, I also run the Santa Barbara Women's Open, uh, which I took over about three years ago. So I have a lot of experience with running tournaments and working with various golf courses. I don't know exactly what kind of qualifications are required, so do you have any questions for me? Well, as the uh, representative to the Golf Advisory Committee, you more than exceed the uh, requirements necessary. <laughs> okay. And you, you will enjoy the meetings. Good. Any other comments or questions? Um, motion? I move for appointment. Second. Second. Yeah. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Passes unanimously and welcome. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. So let's move back to item number six Santa Barbara Beautiful Project Status Report. Ms. Rapp. Assistant Director Jill Zachary will give this report. Chair Connor and members of the commission, the PowerPoint is up. Um, what, what we'd like to do uh, today is give you a, um, a quick update on the projects that we currently receive funding from Santa Barbara Beautiful. As you know, on an annual basis, we've received $10,000 from the organization. Santa Barbara Beautiful is a nonprofit in, in Santa Barbara, and your staff report provides you. Um, with sort of the history of the organization. But as it relates to the city, um, we've been getting support for, gosh, many years. Um, 1977, beginning of the tree planting process and getting designated as a Tree City USA. But more recently, actual cash dollars go into our programs and projects whether they're related to maintaining and caring for young trees and planting trees. They also support um, and purchase trees that we plant as street trees in Santa Barbara on an annual basis. And they support specific projects. And what I'd like to review with you are creek projects, park projects, street trees, landscapes uh, projects, and then also uh, we have a small grant from them for our urban forest management plan, which really speaks to the diversity of projects that the organization uh, funds and, and the important role that they play in our department on an annual basis. Um, we began, and as an example, um, more recently is the Stevens Park San Roque Creek Project, where we did a native plant landscape adjacent to the new restroom in Stevens Park and then also uh, planted uh, native trees next to the creek. Um, this is the third of three, the third project that, that Santa Barbara Beautiful has helped fund related to creeks. They funded um, plants and trees for Sycamore Creek.
Uh, Chair uh, and Commissioners, in regards to uh, the Audubon Society, they, they still provide that information, and we have to get back in touch with a few of them and get those numbers. But that's that's done on an annual basis as well. So you are correct. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Any other questions or comments? I, it's in, uh, thank you for this report because this is an ongoing issue. At, as long as I've been on the commission, that it's been there. And it would be nice if we could, I, I, mean, I don't think we're going to ever solve it per se, but if we can get a better handle on it and um, make it a little bit prettier, maybe less odiferous place to be in the summer. Um, it is, again, a gateway into our community, so it's an important important spot. Thanks. Yes, and thank you for the report. Item number eight. City receives 2000 Seven Integrated Pest Management Innovator Award. Ms. Rapp. Commissioners and Chair Connor, um, you have a very brief report in front of you, and I just wanted to take this opportunity um, to tell you a little bit about our trip up to Sacramento, but mostly to tell you that we will do an official presentation of the IPM Innovator Award at City Council on Tuesday. Um, at 2 o'clock at the start of the meeting and I want to we'll have a lot of our staff there who have worked with the IPM program the city was recognized by the State Department of Pesticide Regulation we were one of eight awards in the history of this award which is for the last 15 or so years only five cities have ever received this award and of course, as we've talked about IPM, they are all the cities that we look to and that we compare ourselves to. So Santa Cruz, San Francisco, um, I'm going to draw a blank here, but Sa uh, I think San Diego. So it really was um, quite an honor for us. Um, Mr. Escobar, Eric Cardenas, who is the chair of our Citizens Advisory Committee, and I flew up. It just so happened that on that day in Sacramento, a number of our council members and our mayor were attending uh, California League of Cities meetings, and so they were able to come over and attend the ceremony. Um, our award was presented by the head of the State Department of Pesticide Regulation. So we were very proud. The city has put so much energy and efforts into the reducing the use of toxic pesticides throughout our community and have implemented this very forward-thinking fair zone model, as you know. Uh, and this IPM Innovator Award really recognized the work that we have done and cited the need for more communities to take the work that we have done and look and see how it could be applied in their own communities. So um, again, the uh, presentation will happen at next week's council meeting. Encourage you, if you can be there, to, to be there and share in our, our ceremony. Just a little aside, um, I was down watching the painting. And I think, to me, this kind of says, how Santos and his staff have embraced it in that Santos showed me his new mow strips and how he, you know, really thought them out to make them work with the skateboard park so that people aren't trampling on the plantings and everything. And I just, I want to give he, Santos and his staff credit for all the work that they have done on the ground to make this work because without them embracing it, it wouldn't have gone forward and you know, I can't say enough about the job you've done about it. So just it's those little things, and I really appreciate finding them out. It's the stuff that I find out every time I go out. Somebody, you learn something new. So thank you. That's what I'd like to give you an applause. This is fabulous. <laughs> Very good. Thank you so much for all that you do for the city. All, uh, I mean, it's incredible uh, the, what the innovative process that we went through to make this happen so quickly. Very, very impressed and very proud of the city and the Parks and Rec Department. Uh, Chair Connor, uh, Commissioner, I'd like to add one thing as well. Uh, in regards to uh, receiving this award, I really want to recognize our 
our entire staff, not only our green team, but uh, like you've seen it all, all of our staff that have embraced our integrated pest management, not only with the Parks and Recreation Department, but uh, with our other uh, departments as well. It's a citywide award that we received. It's not, it's the airport, it's the waterfront, it's streets, public works, downtown parking, you know, all of our folks, uh, even community development, fire department, we're all involved in uh, IPM and reducing uh, chemical use in our uh, entire city. So it's a very positive thing. Thank you. Well said. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, moving on to item um, number nine. We've p gone through that, and we move to item number 10, change in membership of Parks and Recreation Commission to seven members. Ms. Rapp. Chair Connor and Commissioners, the Commission asked to have this item be put on their agenda for discussion. Um, for those of you that um, have been on the Commission a while, you'll remember that in the city charter um, from the days back pre-1990 when we actually had two separate departments, a park department and a recreation department, there was a park commission and a recreation commission. When the department combined into one, they uh, appointed five members to each of those commissions and then scheduled them on the same day but in a joint meeting and so you ended up having a, a meeting in the middle. You would start with a park commission meeting, then um, adjourn that, go to a park and recreation commission meeting, adjourn that, and then have a recreation commission meeting. It was a little confusing for everyone. Um, several years ago, the, um, the commission approved just appointing five people to the two commissions. Therefore, they serve as one body. One of the concerns that the commission mentioned um, and the reason why you asked to have it be put on the agenda is that um, we have had an occasional meeting where we have failed to achieve a, a quorum um, with five members uh, instead of seven. It just you have more opportunities for that. And the other reason that was cited was that we are a department with 17 citizen advisory committees. Um, each of our advisory committees appreciates the liaison that they have from the commission. And our commission has been very dedicated in following their different committees and staying on top of it and reporting back to the Commission about the activities of the advisory committees. Commissioners have expressed concerns just from the challenge of scheduling and being able to attend the meetings, but also the, the sheer number of meetings um, that, uh, that they're trying to attend. So, um, that's really the discussion and what we would ask tonight is if in fact the Commission does want to move forward with making a change in the membership um, of the Commission then um, if you give us that direction then staff will move forward in discussions with the City Attorney, City Attorney's Office, the City Clerk's Office to see how that change could be, how and when that change could be facilitated. Um, so, thank you. <clears throat> Would anyone like to open the comments? Commissioner Longstreet? I, I had served on the commission when there were seven of us between the two and the two and the four, three in the middle. And it, it isn't an unwieldy number. For a commission, I think we see many of the other commissions operating at that level. And um, with, to me, it's not only the number of liaisons we have, but it's the fact that each one of those committees is doing active work. They're not uh, they're not bodies that are simply meeting for a meeting's sake. I mean, we have things going on at the golf course, at tennis. 
it aquatics um, all of which are very relevant to, to what we're doing here and they they've really come to expect our attendance it's not it, when I served on the Lower West Side Advisory Committee I can tell you I never saw a liaison that was 20 years ago um, never saw a liaison but now they really expect us to be there. They have questions for us when we go. They have, in, you know, they want information from what we're seeing in the budget and different things happening at this level. So I think it, it's important from that aspect. And I also think it would give us an opportunity to provide more diversity up here. You know, the more seats, the more different bodies we can fill them with. I think we're doing pretty well right now, but we can always do better. So, um, I mean, right now, although approaching that, we don't have any seniors on. <laughs> so um, I would support moving forward with this. Do you want me to give the rebuttal? Yes. <laughs> Thank you, Commissioner Longstreet. This, it, this, Commissioner is, this is such a tempest in a teapot. It's unbelievable. Um, I was also on the commission when we had seven members, and it was uh, cumbersome, in my opinion. I don't... Uh, I'm on four committees. Um, I haven't had anybody complain about not having adequate representation. Um, I don't think that that's really an issue, and we state in the um, report over the past five years this format has worked well for the public, the commission, and staff. If it's true, why change it? Um, if BB feels overwhelmed by the number of uh, assignments that she has, then we, she may need to give up one of them and somebody else pick up the slack. Also, if you look at it and you do it mathematically, I'm not a math major, but I have run the numbers, the likelihood of getting a quorum with needing four out of seven versus three out of five is something like 57 versus 60 percent. It's a minimal amount. It's almost the same number when it comes out to whether you're going to have uh, people repre enough representation to have a quorum. I can remember only one meeting in the last, what has it been, six years that I've been here, something like that, where we didn't have a quorum. Um, I don't think that that is a real problem for us. Um, if we, at this point, if there are 17 assignments and there's five of us, that's a little over three each. If there's seven of us, was 17, that'll be a little over two each. That doesn't seem overwhelming to me. Um, the other question I had was about the charter amendment, and that is, uh, I see that the procedure would be, if you decided to change this, that it could be changed and then later sent to the charter language uh, from a vote of the people. Um, so I'll hold my question for a minute, but my question ultimately is can you actually implement that and then get a um, subsequent approval or do you have to get the approval in advance? Um, the other thing, and maybe the most important thing, is how difficult it is to find people that I think are qualified and willing to serve and, this, and put this much time into this. And the last time when Duraka, who was the last person to come on, was... Uh, and it was advertised, and it was out there, and it, um, there was a seat available. I believe there were two applicants that were interviewed for that. All right, now, the next time around, just assuming there's one less of us, there would be a kind of an average each uh, year that would, uh, if, there's, if the term is four years. Now are you going to get three qualified people, or are you just going to get, you know, three people that have some vague knowledge and vague interest in uh, the whole process? And the last point I would make is it takes some time to get up to speed on this commission. It took me some time when I began. I'm sure it took Bibi some time when she started. We've been bringing Duraka up to speed. He's fortunately very bright and has uh, gotten up to speed quickly. But we, every time there is an increase or a new member, you end up having to spend so much time going over and over things that everybody that's on the commission already knows about. Okay, to educate one person at a time, as you have a new member coming on the board, you know, that's a perfectly reasonable thing to do. To have to now educate three new people, 
is, you know, going to be very, very difficult, and bringing all those people up to speed on all the issues that we've dealt with over these years is going to be problematic. So I um, would oppose changing it, and I frankly can't see any logical reason to even consider it. Thank you, Commissioner Forsell. Commissioner Gonzalez? I, I personally support the uh, seven members in the commission to provide additional individuals from different parts of the community, and I'm sure we can get some people who are qualified. Um, I also um, support the seven members, and my reasoning behind that is when you were talking about getting people up to speed, um, Bibi, myself, and probably you too, Steve, will be leaving the commission soon, and I was thinking that it would take at least three extra people to fill our shoes. So, so <laughs> just had to add a little levity to this, but I, um, I, I go along with the, the seven members as well. So, with that said, Chair, Chair Connor, yes. would you like me to provide the information that um, Commissioner Forsell asked about related to the city charter? Yes, absolutely, okay. if you would do that. And um, if, if someone would like to um, craft a motion to uh, provide direction to staff regarding how to proceed in this manner, I am open to what you might like to do. I would move that we um, ask staff to pursue increasing the Parks and Recreation Commission to seven members um, and get, get us further information on what's necessary to do this. I need a second. Second that motion. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. Passes with three ayes and one opposition. Um, in Will we get that in our next packet? Or? Actually, I'd like to give you some information now. Oh, if you could to, do that, that would be wonderful. Be clear. Yes, thank you. Um, and uh, just uh, the, the Park and Recreation Commissions are one of the charter commissions. So the structure of those commissions is identified in the city charter. Um, as mentioned, any changes to the city charter require a vote of the people. It just so happens that the city is considering taking some various small charter changes to public vote in the next election. Uh, we would hope to include any changes to um, related to the Park and Recreation Commissions at that time. What we would be proposing most likely is that the two com commissions be combined into one since they now represent one department and that uh, given your um, direction that the commission be extend extended to seven members. So staff will talk with the city attorney's office and the city clerk's office. That is the timing that I think we would be working towards and and it will then go out for a public vote. Changes to the city charter are very, very rare. They don't happen, for this, they, they just don't happen very frequently. So changes to the charter should be very well considered because however the charter is written, we are, I don't know exactly the answer to the question that, um, Commissioner Forsell asked in terms of, you know, if you want to do something different that's in the charter, clearly we found a way to make that work with the two commissions, combining them into one and all of that. But, um, but the city charter guides the city and, and, and we follow that. So staff will talk with the city attorney, we'll talk with the city clerk, we'll come back and give you um, that information and uh, and know that we'll be working toward that according to their timeline. Uh, if in fact they are going to take changes to the city charter forward for a public vote. Now, when you say the next um, election, I presume you're talking about November 2009. That would be correct. That would be the next local election. 
not the next uh, statewide or national Actually, I, I can't comment to that because I don't know which election that they are talking about, but it okay. it's, uh, would be a local election, I'm assuming. So we're looking down the road. Yes. Okay. But we are getting the wheels in motion, if yes. possible. Thank you. Um, so when you get after your uh, conversation with the city attorney, you'll have more information for us about that. Um, and are there any other comments or anything? Okay. Then we'll move on to item number 11, which is our barbecue open fire prohibition in city sports facilities. Mr. Uh, staff is bringing this to you for information and concurrence. I want to just point out that establishing this policy is within the purview of the Parks and Recreation Director, but I have wanted to bring these kinds of policy issues forward to the Commission, especially where we're talking about policies that affect all park users. Um, so I um, am sharing with you a recommendation from staff. We are highest priority in all of our policies that we have in our parks is park user safety for all park users. And we have been having an increasing problem in some of our ball field facilities with um, people bringing in barbecues. We've actually had people digging pits in these areas, bringing barbecues in, burning wood, not charcoal, burning charcoal, leaving charcoal and, um, you know, the coals in unsafe locations. Um, these are not picnic areas. Uh, if we have a special tournament or event that is having food as part of that process, they may have a barbecue, but it will be done by permit. So what we are proposing is that we actually implement a policy that prohibits barbecues at these three ball field facilities. So that would be Dwight Murphy, Cabrillo Ball Field, and Pershing Park. And um, again, we just have seen this. It's been an increasing occurrence. I, I will also um, just share with you that we have just a few restrictions in some of our other parks. In the new Chase Palm Park expansion, no barbecues are allowed. Uh, in um, uh, Schofield Park, there are restrictions on barbecues. And in most of our other areas, we have really tried to accommodate park users uh, in our areas where we have more families bringing in barbecues for family events and things like that, we've been able to install containers for people to safely um, uh, get rid of their coals. And so we really do try to accommodate uh, all of our park users where we can, but this is a policy that we believe is the right thing to do at this time in these particular locations. So we would ask that the Commission concur with that recommendation and we will move forward with getting appropriate signage in place. Just a question, what would be the difference in uh, doing a barbecue with a permit versus none? The, the primary difference, uh, Chair Connor and Commissioner Gonzalez, is that when you have a permit, there are a set of restrictions and requirements for you to be able to have that permit. And we also have staff that are visiting all of those park sites that have a permit to make sure that they are following the rules and regulations associated with their permit. So we have more oversight. Thank you. Commissioner Longstreet. Um, I think really we're addressing truly a safety issue, especially in these three areas. And I think we've seen an increase in um, incidents that um, have required police response and things like that. And I think it's, you know, it's so unfortunate that a few people can wreck it for a lot of people, but we're back there again. And um, I would more than support this for the safety of the, the ball field users as well as our staff. 
um, and other city staff. So, uh, you know, I, I wish it were, we lived in such a world where everybody was responsible, but we're not. So, And I would move that we support the staff um, recommendation to prohibit the use of barbecues and open fires at Cabrillo Ballfield, Dwight Murphy Ballfield, and Pershing Park, except by permit. I need a second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? I voted for it. Oh, okay. Passes unanimously. With that said, I uh, need a motion for adjournment. Second. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. Passes unanimous, unanimously. We are now adjourned. Travel this land.